In a previous exercise, we looked at this particular function, which consists of a product of two square roots. And then we said, if you use the conventional choice of branch cut for each of these different factors, then you end up with a branch cut for the whole function of the line segment between minus one and plus one. The question is, can you change something about your conventions of branch cuts such that for the whole function, you end up, for example, with a branch cut going from minus infinity to one, and then from one to plus infinity. To see what you need to change in the derivation of the previous exercise to end up with that alternative choice of, uh, of branch cut. Let's revisit what we had for the previous calculation. So what we did is we expressed the arguments of the two square roots in polar coordinates with an angle theta and an angle phi. So theta is the angle here centered around the point one and then phi is the angle there. And then we identified some important points around the, the real axis. And then we also made a little table here where we applied the conventional choice of branch cuts for both theta and phi meaning that the angles vary between minus pi and pi. So if we made that particular choice of branch cut for the individual factors, then we ended up with that, uh, these arguments for the basis of the combined function. And then we were also able to identify that if we jumped, for example, uh, from the point three to the point six over here. So if you, if you see that if we jump from three to six, we end up with a pi phase shift. So in this particular case, if you cross the line from minus one to plus one, you end up with a pi phase shift, and this is where the branch cut is. Okay, so now let's try and tweak this a little bit and see if we can come up with a different branch cut. So let's for fun, uh, let's take a different, a different color here. Let's for fun say that for theta and for theta only, we're going to restrict the angles, not from minus pi to plus pi, but from zero to two pi. So this means that here we have pi, that's also going to be pi, that's going to be pi, and that's going to be two pi. So in the bottom half of this first column, we basically add two pi to the, the entries that we have here. Again, we have full freedom to do so. Branch cuts are arbitrarily defined. It's just a convention. As long as we have a recipe to make the function single valued, then we're happy. Doesn't matter what that recipe is, just as long as you stick to that. Okay, let's see how that change propagates to the uh, right column. So the, the, the resulting uh, theta plus phi divided by two. So again, the second column we leave intact because otherwise you can easily verify that nothing will, will change. So now rather than for the point five, instead of minus pi, we have zero. Here we have pi over two, pi over two, and there we have pi. Okay, uh, previously when we jumped from three to six, we had a phase shift, but now if you compare three to six, we go from two pi, so from pi over two to pi over two, so nothing changes. So in this case, if we jump from, uh, if you jump across this line here between minus one and plus one, the function stays continuous. But it's very different over here. If we jump from zero to eight, then you see up here, we go from, uh, sorry, if we jump from the point one to the point eight, then we jump from a phase zero to a phase pi. So all of a sudden now we do have a jump there. Likewise, if we jump from four to five in the table, you would also verify very quickly that you have a pi phase shift over there. So in this particular case, our new branch cut lies from minus infinity to minus one and from one to plus infinity. So making this change, we end up with a different choice of branch cut. And again, we have full freedom to do so. Small remark here, if you look at some representations of the Riemann surface of this function that we have in the, in the course notes, then you might see, okay, some figures, they seem to suggest a branch cut between minus one and plus one. And if we plot the Riemann surface in a slightly different way, we end up with a figure that suggests a branch cut from minus infinity to minus one and from one to plus infinity. 
So does that mean that there's some sort of natural choice of branch cut because the figures suggest something, but then again, different figures seem to suggest different choices. So, so what's the deal here? Again, remember, there's no such thing as a natural choice of branch, branch cuts because we have full freedom to place the branch cut where we want, just as long as we have a recipe to make the function single valued. The fact that sometimes we end up with a representation of the Riemann surface that seems to suggest a certain branch cut is basically an accident. Because don't forget, the Riemann surface is a four-dimensional beast. And in order for us humans to visualize it, we project that down to three dimensions. And then sometimes we get a figure that suggests a certain branch cut. And sometimes we get a figure that suggests a different branch cut. But that's not something that's in contradiction with each other. It's just a consequence of the fact of projecting down a higher dimensional object to a lower dimensional object. It's something that you should be very familiar with in daily life. If you go, for example, from three dimensions to two dimensions, if you have this poorly drawn cylinder over here and you project it by looking in that direction, you end up with a rectangle. If you project it from the top, you end up with a completely different shape, a circle. So again, there's no inherent intrinsic choice of branch cut. It's just something that seems to be suggested by a figure, but that's just an accident of uh, projection.